Hello, and welcome to the final part of the most obscure conspiracy theories iceberg explained. It's been a fun ride so far, and I'm anxious to see what the final conspiracies are. I have also added some bonus conspiracies that I've came across over the years that have intrigued me. So without further ado, let's get started. 1707 Japanese Photo On October 28, 1707, around 2 p.m., Japan would suffer its largest earthquake in history up to that point. It was an 8.6 on the Richter scale and would not be surpassed until the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. The disaster caused quite a bit of damage and also resulted in a tsunami, which caused more than 5,000 deaths. And not only was this earthquake devastating enough on its own, it's also thought that it quite possibly caused the last eruption on Mount Fuji, which occurred only 49 days later. And that eruption ties directly into our first conspiracy. The Hawaii eruption on Mount Fuji started on December 7th of 1707 and ended on February 24th, 1708. This infamous eruption is known for the ash it created over eastern Japan. There was so much of it that it covered many of the cultivated fields, leading to starvation for people in the area. It would even lead to avalanches, which were responsible for even more deaths. So it's safe to say that the explosion itself was devastating. So it's no wonder why some people claim that it was so powerful that it changed the appearance of Mount Fuji entirely. And that's where the conspiracy comes in. Allegedly, there was a photo taken before the eruption that showed a very much different looking mountain than the one we see today. And at some point, this photo was lost to the sands of time, which of course, would contradict everything we know about the history of photography. The earliest known surviving photograph comes from 1826 by French inventor Nicephore Nieps a full century later. But in defense of this conspiracy, the infancy of photography can be traced back to 1717 with German professor Johann Heinrich Schultz. But even with that fact, it's still over a decade later than when this photograph of Mount Fuji was supposedly taken. So the question is, could there have been a working camera in Japan over a century before the one in Europe was created? And if so, what happened to it? More specifically, what happened to this alleged photograph? While I always say anything is possible, there's no real data available on this one. I gotta give it a 1. 6500 BC writing. Pretty much since humans have walked the earth, there have been some type of written communication used. Going back to 35,000 BC is where it's thought the earliest writing was found, which was just several symbols used in combination to convey seasonal behavior of the animals that were hunted. But this writing, well, it was mostly just symbols and little drawings. There were no real letters or alphabet. That wouldn't be officially created until around 3200 BC, with credit going to the Sumerian civilization. But according to this conspiracy, there is a type of writing that goes back at least 3000 years prior in 6500 BC. This writing is called the Bencha symbols, and they come from the Bencha culture of Southeast Europe. These symbols are still untranslated and not fully understood. The first discovery came in 1875 by archaeologist Zofia Torma in Romania, who unearthed marble and fragments of pottery inscribed with the previously unseen symbols. Ever since this discovery, there's been a debate. Is this a writing system or just random symbols? The debate would only heighten in 1961 when a team led by Nikolai Vlasa would discover the Tartaria tablets in Romania. These clay tablets have created considerable controversy among archaeologists, some who have claimed that this is the official proof of the earliest known form of writing in the world. And scholars are not sure of the timeline, but there is a general consensus that they date to about 5300 BC, predating the Sumerians by a couple millennia. The tablets themselves are made up of two rectangular ones and one round one. They are small, just a couple of inches, and two of them have holes drilled through them. All of them have symbols inscribed on one side. The unpierced rectangular one depicts a horned animal, an unclear figure, and some kind of plant. The other two are made up of abstract symbols. Outside of the Tartaria tablets, there's been many more inscriptions discovered, mostly on pottery. They vary between abstract and representative pictograms, including animal-like representations. There's also symbols like crosses and chevrons of the 1,178 inscriptions found, 5,421 actual symbols have been catalogued. But here's the issue. 
The authenticity of the engravings are heavily disputed. There's even been recent claims of flat-out forgery. The main arguments that this is indeed a writing system is as follows. The fact that the symbols are standardized and have a rectilinear shape comparable to other writing systems. Secondly, the information communicated by each character is specific. Finally, the inscriptions come in rows, whether they be horizontal, vertical, or circular. Of course, many scholars disagree and claim that the first known writing systems were created by early states to help with the record keeping in complex organized societies and that there was no evidence that one of these societies existed in the Balkans in this time period. Therefore, the Vincia would not need a writing system. There's also the fact that over 85% of the inscriptions consist of only one symbol. They argue that the inscriptions are most likely just property marks, symbols that simply state, this belongs to me, whereas some point to the possibility of a numerical system, or perhaps symbols that were used for religious ceremonies. So what to give this one? I gotta go with a four. If you have listened to my previous videos, you know that I have a belief that the ancient peoples were way more advanced than we give them credit for, and I wouldn't doubt that there was a writing system in place way before the Sumerians. Calvine, Floating Island On August 4, 1990, two hikers near Calvine, Scotland would take a photograph of a mysterious diamond-shaped flying object hovering in the sky. This photo has went on to become what many have called the best UFO picture ever, leaving undeniable proof of alien visitation. And what only makes that stranger is the photo vanished for 32 years, leaving many people to speculate about what exactly happened. It was only recently rediscovered in 2022 thanks to the efforts of British journalist David Clark, who put 13 years of research into finding the photo, and he finally found it with a former Royal Air Force press officer named Craig Lindsay, who had held on to a copy of the last remaining original print, just waiting for someone to inquire about it. The photo, which was really one of six in the series, shows a diamond-shaped object flying in the sky while a fighter jet can be spotted in the background. When it was originally taken in 1990, the hikers took the photo to Scotland's Daily Record newspaper, but the paper instead handed the image over to the British Ministry of Defense, which had held on to it for those 32 years. The Ministry of Defense, after coming into possession of the photograph, would even pursue the negatives, which they also obtained. And as far as the negatives go, the Ministry of Defense claims they returned them back to the Daily Record, but the Daily Record claims they never received them. The two hikers remain unidentified as well, as they have hidden due to privacy concerns, and they will only be revealed in 2072. And despite all the press, these two have never voluntarily came forward, although one could surmise that maybe they just don't want to deal with the headache of UFO enthusiasts hounding them. But what we do know is these two men were chefs in a hotel who went for a hike one evening when they spotted the huge diamond-shaped object moving silently across the sky. They were able to snap off six photos before they got too scared and ran off into the woods and waited. It was then that they seen the jet start circling the object. Clark, who rediscovered the photo, has since taken it to a senior lecturer in photography named Andrew Robison, who said the image shows no signs of manipulation. Quote, It follows that this is either a genuine unidentified flying object in the sky, or that any construction or manipulation used to create this effect occurred in front of the camera and not in the capturing of the scene on film, nor in the subsequent processing and printing of the image." End quote. Clark, on the other hand, does not believe it is alien. Rather, he believes it was a top-secret project developed by the British military, maybe even the mythical Aurora, which was a top-secret reconnaissance aircraft that was rumored to have been worked on by the U.S. in the 80s, which the U.S. has consistently denied its existence. However, skeptics point out to one big flaw with this picture. They say that this legendary photo is nothing more than a rock in the water, and what you're really seeing is an optical illusion. If you look at this photo closer, you'll notice that the airplane looks like a reflection on the water. In fact, it looks like the bottom of the plane. And then there's the trees up above with the fence line below, which makes it look like someone took a perfectly timed picture of a rock in the water. And once you photoshop some ripples into it, it seems fairly obvious. And as far as the fighter jet goes, in the 90s, there were a ton of these flying foam jet gliders advertised all over the UK. Lots of kids had them. It's just possible that it was purchased and hung from the tree to make it look like a real jet in the background. Secondly, there's the theory that the whole thing 
was just a complete duplicate of a UFO sighting from the 80s in Puerto Rico where the man taking the photo came out and admitted it was a total hoax. And finally, the most interesting part in all this, the allegation that the Minister of Defense blocked the release of the photo. That's the key part to this whole conspiracy. And that is what has always given this credibility. But it turns out, the British Ministry of Defense did not block its release, at least according to a FOIA request. According to the British government, the only thing being kept classified is the names of the two individuals who took the photo because they requested they be kept anonymous. But their names will be released to the public in 2072. As far as the photo goes, it's always been available. It's just no one ever asked to see it. Finally, there's a much more simple hoax theory here, which is that the picture doesn't involve a rock in the water at all, and that it's really taken in a field where the UFO is nothing more than a mountaintop and the airplane is hanging down from a string. YouTuber Gary Bosolelli has even claimed to have found the exact spot of the photograph. When I first started reading over this one, I was going to give it a 5. I thought this was definitely the one case that was real, or possibly some kind of secret British technology. But the more I researched it, the more it seemed hoaxy, if that's a word. For that, I'm going to give it a 2. Although I will say, if we could see the other photos, I may change my mind. Depression Era Celebrity Zoo During the economic recession of the early 30s, some of the western countries were hit harder by the market crash than others. This theory stipulates that the elite of the time built human zoos which consisted of celebrities that had fallen on hard times, but not like an animal zoo per se. Think of a musician for example. A nightclub would be built for this down on his luck formerly famous musician in which people, my guess is the elite, would go by and watch him play music but not like an audience. They would instead be viewing it from the outside, kinda like you look at animals in a zoo cage. Or think about elaborate stages and film sets that were totally recreated just to have some broken down actor come play his part over and over and over for curious onlookers. This one, I can't find anything about. I think it's an obvious one. Antarctic Cryptozoology an interesting one here. This one is basically what it sounds like. It's the study of cryptids in the Antarctic. The theory alleges that because of the lack of people there, the few sightings we do have are way more significant. If you have listened to my mystery icebergs before, you'll know I already discussed a couple of these. The Ningen, as well as the large Antarctic sea mammal, which some claim is as big as an island. There's also the Kagabon, which I briefly discussed. With cryptids, I'm always open-minded. Plus, who knows what's at the bottom depths of the ocean? I'm going to give this one a 5. 4% Medical Malpractice Study Another interesting one here. According to a study, around 250,000 to 440,000 people die a year due to medical malpractice. This study, which was performed by John Hopkins pre-COVID, stated that medical malpractice was the third leading cause of death in America right behind heart disease and cancer. While that is surprising, or maybe not, there was supposedly another anonymous study that found that 4% of these deaths, well, they were intentional. And again, I can't find any real info about this supposedly anonymous study, but there is already some publicly available data on medical care providers who murder. First, it's just a mind-boggling amount of doctors and nurses who killed patients routinely. Dr. Harold Shipman of the UK kill 218 alone, and possibly up to 250. In fact, a study in 2006 found that an average of 35 Americans are intentionally killed by healthcare providers every year, and they suspect the number is higher than that. Nurses account for 86% of these. One example was a German nurse who was convicted of killing 85 outpatients, and he stated his only reason for doing it was boredom and the excitement of resuscitation. But back to the conspiracy at hand, I think this one has some credibility. Was there an anonymous study done? I would bet on it. Was the number really 4%? I don't know if I would go that high or not. Let's look back at the original number of malpractice deaths, which is 250,000 to 440,000 a year. Now let's get a good middle ground. We'll settle for 350,000 deaths a year. If my math is correct, 4% of 350,000 is 14,000. I find it a bit hard to imagine. 14,000 intentional murders a year by medical care. Even 1% would be 3,500, and that's a bit much for me. 
but at least that one is a little bit more believable. I guess it depends on how many psychopaths are in the medical field. I'm going to give this one a 3, because although I don't believe that the number was 4%, I do believe there was an anonymous study done, and I do believe whatever number they did find shocked them. Hey guys, we're halfway through the last layer of this final iceberg, and I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce Truth is Scarier Than Fiction. If you guys remember, there were a few conspiracies in the first few videos of this series that I just could not find much info on. Thankfully, I actually ended up finding the creator of this iceberg on YouTube. He agreed to come on and elaborate on some of the theories that I missed, as well as expand on some of the other ones. I will put the link to his channel in the description below. In Central Africa, there are two cryptids known as the Nagubu and the Dodu. The Nagubu is a rhino or triceratops-like cryptid known to attack both canoes and elephants. The Dodu is a large ape that's known to kill prey and then leave the bodies out to feed on the maggots and bugs that infest it. Very gross, I know. Anyways, there are three stories of what appear to be the same group capturing the creatures or buying parts of them. In 2000, a Nagubu was apparently shot and the horns of the creature were sawn off and sold to a group of French loggers. Around the same time, a Dodu was apparently captured and exhibited near the town of Molundu. It's believed that the same group of French loggers who bought the Nagubu horns also captured the Dodu. Around the same time, another Dodu was shot and killed, with the body being sold to a French timber merchant. It seems that there were a group of French loggers who were buying rare cryptids. Whoever these men are is unknown. There seems to be no further record of their existence or what happened to the cryptids they bought and captured after these stories. One thing that wasn't mentioned in the Gangsters Ghostwriting Mob Movie section is an episode of The Sopranos. While The Sopranos is a fictional TV show, many events in the show are actually based on real life events that happened in the Mafia. One plotline revolves around a gangster basically ghostwriting the plotline for a screenplay by Jon Favreau. Additionally, Michael Franzese, a YouTuber and former mobster, actually briefly ran a movie production company. His ownership of the company was apparently part of an effort by the mob to improve their reputation, since up until that point, the movies the Mafia were associated with were mostly violent. However, he later had to give the company up after he was arrested. The SSPL, or Sacred Sword of the Patriots League, was the fake secret organization that the United States government tried to set up during the Vietnam War. But the conspiracy here is, what if it actually succeeded? The theory goes that the US was successful in getting high-level officials into the Vietnamese government. Only 20 years after the war ended, US and Vietnamese relations began to thaw. The two countries later signed several agreements and partnerships. Maybe the US government trained some allies that made it into high-level government positions. In the first video, Insomnia discussed an unidentified woman who had been found in a witch elm. However, there's some odd information about her death that's still been unexplained. For example, her hand was found severed and away from the rest of her body. Combined with the fact that she was found in a literal witch elm, that led some people to theorize that she was killed by occultists. Additionally, she was killed during the height of World War II. Many Nazis were known to be into the occult, which has led some people to theorize that Bella's killing was some sort of Nazi occultist ritual. Insomnia covered the rumor that Smallville was ended due to one of the stars being in a cult, though he couldn't find much on it. The theory goes that the producers heard reports that Allison Mack, who was one of the show's stars, was using the show to recruit young women in the cast and crew. Since she was a big star in the show, the producers decided to end the show instead of firing her. It should also be pointed out that the CW never worked with Mac again after Smallville ended, even though she wasn't arrested until over six years after the show's finale. Or, like Insomnia said, maybe it had just run out of steam after 10 seasons, though the CW did keep Supernatural around for 15 seasons. The conspiracy behind loggers killing zoologists is essentially the theory that loggers will try and cover up our animals in order to prevent lands from becoming protected. This theory doesn't just apply to loggers, but also to trappers, the oil industry, 
and basically any other industry that deals with areas with wildlife. The reasoning goes that the loggers will kill these zoologists so that the zoologists aren't able to share evidence that could make these places become protected habitats. If the areas did become protected, then the industries wouldn't be able to work there. This kind of goes back to that 1894 Bigfoot photo, which was allegedly part of a conspiracy to hide Bigfoot so that the trapping company could continue working unimpeded. In 2005, a film adaptation of the TV series Miami Vice was being filmed. The executive producer of the series, Michael Mann, was directing, and the movie was led by stars Jamie Foxx and Colin Farrell. The movie was going to have an explosive ending to be filmed in Paraguay. Before it could be filmed, however, an incident, or rather several incidents, occurred during filming in the Dominican Republic. A police officer apparently got into a gunfight with a security member that was provided by the Dominican Republic military, with one person being seriously wounded. Some also claimed that the director hired actual gang members to be security and filmed in extremely dangerous areas. This incident spooked Jamie Foxx, who fled the country and refused to continue filming abroad. This resulted in the ending having to be changed, which many considered to have hurt the quality of the film. It also delayed the shooting of the movie. This theory states that a rival Hollywood studio was behind some of the violence in the Dominican Republic at the time in an effort to sabotage the film and the studio behind it. It's kind of similar to the Winona Ryder studio sabotage theory. The delays due to the shooting and other difficulties made the budget grow to an estimated $150 million. Whether or not there was a rival studio behind the movie's problems, the movie likely lost tens of millions of dollars when you account for the budget and the cost of marketing. Lead is generally believed to make people more prone to violence, have lower impulse control, and have behavioral issues. Lead poisoning was also very prevalent right around the fall of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain. The theory that lead ended the Cold War states that the effects of lead poisoning were also a big contributor to the Iron Curtain government's falling and Soviet-backed movements in the Western Bloc running out of steam. It was the peak of decades of lead poisoning that explains the end of the almost 50-year-long Cold War and multiple governments in only a few years. The theory that shipping companies funded Netflix is a theory that when Netflix started out, they had some secret financial support from shipping companies. Since Netflix's primary business model at the time was shipping DVDs to people, something that was quite easy for the companies to do since DVDs are small, the shipping companies would have gained quite a bit of money if Netflix became successful. So they financially supported them, and this support helped destroy Netflix's competitors. Ironically, since Netflix has since mainly moved to streaming, if this conspiracy is true, the companies who helped Netflix didn't get much long-term gain out of it. Uncontacted tribes still exist in the United States conspiracy. It's pretty well known that there are tribes of indigenous peoples in the world who have still not made contact with the outside world, perhaps most famously, is that of the Sentinelese people of North Sentinel Island, who have been called the most isolated people in the world. They are known to kill people who try to make contact with them. But there are quite a few more tribes out there. In fact, most estimates put it to between 100 and 200 uncontacted tribes in the world, and estimated to be up to 10,000 people. The majority of these are in South America, particularly Brazil, where it's estimated that around 80 tribes are there. The second most comes from New Guinea, in which 40 estimated uncontacted tribes are there. But this theory clearly states that the U.S. also has them. So let's look at the official historical take first. According to the historians, the last official uncontacted tribe was that of the Yahi people of Northern California. This tribe would greatly suffer during the California Genocide, during which the army and militias carried out routine killings of various indigenous peoples, as well as forcibly relocating several thousands of them. By around 1865, the Yahi population would drop to less than 100, and by 1871, 80 plus of them had been slaughtered by the settlers. The last known survivor of this group was a man known by the name of Ishii. He would spend most of his life hiding in the Sierra wilderness. He would finally emerge at a barn and corral near Oroville, California. He was 50 years old and was dubbed, quote, the last wild Indian, end quote. He only came out because his last remaining relatives had passed. 
they had hid so well that everyone thought the Yahi were extinct. Ishii would spend the remaining years of his life studied by anthropologists at the University of California, where he was also hired as a janitor. And that's pretty much the end of that depressing story. And according to the scholars, he was the last official uncontacted indigenous person. So what's up with this conspiracy? Sadly, I can find very little mention of this online. The only thing even close was a story on r slash no sleep, which I assume is to be fiction, since that account has posted several other fictitious stories, which leads me down a different path. I think this conspiracy might not be referencing true Native American tribes, but instead, it may be addressing the conspiracy of uncontacted feral people living in national forest. So we'll look at that conspiracy instead. This theory got really popular over the past few years, especially on TikTok. But where did these stories get started? Is there any proof? I'm not sure where it got its start, but I have a guess. I think it kind of spun off the popular 411 Missing series by David Pilatus. And if you're not familiar, that's a series about all these weird and creepy disappearances in national parks here in the U.S. David collects all the ones that are unexplained and presents them in his book series. It's left a door open for many people to try and guess what is happening, and I believe this theory has sprung up from that. As far as proof, well, there have been instances of feral people found before. That's quite well documented, but this theory is a bit different. These feral people are said to inhabit the national parks and roam around freely sometimes chasing or killing people in the forest. Unfortunately, a lot of this proof comes from social media influencers, many who claim to have had an encounter or heard screams from these feral people. The most famous case connected with them is that of Dennis Martin, which I discussed in one of my mystery videos. Dennis was a young boy who, with his relatives and friends, planned on jumping out from behind some bushes to scare the adults. The adults were playing along and knew the kids were there. However, as the kids jumped out to spook the adults, Dennis was not there. They would start to look for him, but he was gone. They would contact the rangers, who also helped. Eventually, a massive search would ensue, in which the Green Berets even helped, but Dennis nor his remains were ever found. Since then, a popular theory has popped up that this group of feral men snatched up Dennis. This most certainly comes from the fact that the Green Berets were caught in, and because of one eyewitness account, from a man that supposedly heard a scream and then saw a man running through the forest on the day of the disappearance. But is there any real concrete proof of feral people? Not really. And as someone that lives in the Appalachians, where most of the feral people are supposed to be, I've never seen one. Are there homeless people in the woods? Yes. But feral people, I have not seen. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but I'm still gonna go with a one on this one though. 1969, Asteroid Landing. This one is a spin-off of the moon landing hoax theory that basically states that instead of landing on the moon, the U.S. landed on an asteroid to fake their footage for the moon landing, all in an effort to win the space race. The speculation of the theory kind of revolves around the thought that it would have been much easier to land on a passing asteroid than it would be the moon. Let's start with the obvious problems with this. Scientists estimate that several dozen asteroids fly by Earth at a distance closer than the moon every year. Those sizes cover an area between 20 to 39 feet, which is not very big. Not only would that be incredibly difficult to land on, even if you were capable, is this really going to be suitable to take convincing pictures? But that's not even the biggest issue. Even though there are several dozen asteroids passing by every year, only a tiny amount are detected. And that's with today's technology. Detecting one in 1969 would be even more difficult. In fact, I found the detected asteroids by year online and I discovered that in 1969, no asteroids were even detected. So unless you believe that was covered up too, then this conspiracy is pretty much dead. Going with a one. Black Plague was a biological weapon. The Golden Horde was an offshoot of the Mongol Empire that sprung up in the 13th century. And just like the Mongols, they too would begin to rip themselves apart from within. By the late 14th century, their efforts to conquer would start to stall out. This theory alleges that as that happened, they grew more desperate and intentionally spread the Black Plague into Europe and Africa. The basis of this theory comes from a 14th century account by the Gianese Gabriele di Mussi, who was a notary known for his vivid account of the Black Death. His account led to the belief that the plague reached Europe by way of Crimea as a result of a biological warfare attack. The plague, as you know, is probably the most devastating public health disaster in history. It killed up to one quarter, or maybe even a third, 
of Europe's population, with North Africa being hit just as hard. I read now from UC's memoir, quote, The dying Tartars, stunned and stupefied by the immensity of the disaster, brought about by the disease, and realizing they had no hope of escape, lost interest in the siege, but they ordered corpses to be placed in the catapults and lobbed into the city in the hope that the intolerable stench would kill everyone inside. What seemed like mountains of dead were thrown into the city, and the Christians could not hide or flee or escape from them, although they dumped as many of the bodies as they could in the sea, and soon the rotting corpses tainted the air and poisoned the water supply, and the stench was so overwhelming that hardly one in several thousand was in position to flee the remains of the Tartar army. Moreover, one infected man could carry the poison to others and affect people and places with the disease by look alone. No one knew or could discover a means of defense." End quote. So according to this, the Tartars, who were subjugated by the Mongol Empire, hurled plague-infected cadavers into the besieged Crimean city of Kaffa, thereby transmitting the disease to its inhabitants, and that the fleeing Italian survivors spread the plague from Kaffa to the Mediterranean. If this account is correct, then it's possible that this was the start of the biggest biological attack in history. Scholars state there is no doubt that the plague entered into the Mediterranean from Crimea as well. However, they've always believed that it came from the Genoese trade ships leaving Crimea where the fleas from rats were also on the ship and then spread the disease once they reached the ports of Italy. Whereas this conspiracy states that it was actually spread from this Mongol biological attack. But there's a couple of issues against this. One was that D. Moussi's account was probably second hand, and most think he wasn't even there. In fact, the opening line in his memoir is written by a scribe and it states, quote, Here begins an account of the disease or mortality which occurred in 1348, put together by Gabriele de Mussi's of Piacenza, end quote, which makes it kind of sound like de Mussi put the story together based on what he was told, not witnessed. Secondly, is the fact that a number of other ports in Crimea were under Mongol control at the time, and it's not likely that the plague was just coming from Kaffa only. There were also several overland caravan routes that ran through the Middle East, connecting trade from East to Europe, so even if this alleged biological attack didn't happen, it wouldn't have mattered. The Black Death would have still reached Europe. Finally, there's also the thought that it's possible the Tartars were simply launching the bodies over the walls just to get them out of their own encampment and weren't trying to use it as a biological weapon at all. Regardless, I'm going to give this one a 5, because I think the introduction of the plague to Kaffa stems from the launching of these diseased cadavers into the city, but I don't believe it was the sole cause of the plague spreading throughout Europe, as that was going to come several ways. Dan Schneider 4chan Whistleblower In 2018, Deadline Hollywood released a report that Nickelodeon was parting ways with the longtime producer Dan Schneider. They also reported there were complaints about Schneider's alleged behavior, one being his temper but the other was his tweets, which seemed to like showing pics of young actresses' feet. Nickelodeon refused to comment. However, three years later, a report would come out that Schneider was cut after an internal investigation by Viacom, who is the parent company of Nickelodeon. And at first, the investigation only cited his anger issues and said there was no evidence of sexual misconduct. But by August 2022, Insider reported new allegations from former actors and employees many of them stating Dan would ask for massages from his adult female colleagues. The report went on to say that someone close to Schneider had said that Dan regretted asking for the massage and agreed it was inappropriate. That was about as far as the sexual accusations went, although some claimed that the shows Dan produced had, quote, sexualized, end quote, scenes. But executives at Nickelodeon denied this and claimed that the parents were there watching every bit of the show and approving what was recorded. But the conspiracy is, that this was predicted on 4chan way before it became public knowledge, and it's led many to believe that it was a whistleblower. But hold up, as I mentioned in a previous 4chan theory, stuff is continuously thrown on the wall there. It's bound that a prediction sooner or later sticks. It could be, just by chance, that's what happened here. My problem is that the whole thing kind of spun out of control, and all these other elements got brought into the story, such as the claim that the poster was Robert Downey Jr., but it's not just that the anonymous message board site would also go on to make other claims about Schneider, claims that I won't discuss here and have not yet been proven. But since I do mostly believe the original post were a legit whistleblower, I'm going to give it a 3.
Now that we have reached the conclusion of this series, I want to thank Truth is Scarier Than Fiction, since he was the one that came up with the iceberg, and for also shining some light on the conspiracies that I couldn't find much info on. You should check his channel out. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now time for some bonus content. These are a few conspiracies that I've ran across over the years, and they have really intrigued me. I won't be giving a rating on them, I'm simply presenting them to you to see what you all think. My first couple come from one of my favorite cartoons in the early 2000s called Justice League Unlimited. On that show was a character named Question. He's a minor character, so you've probably not heard of him. But if you've seen the movie Watchmen, the character Warshack was based on Question. The Question doesn't have any superpowers. His real talent is gathering information and using it effectively. He's the Justice League's data guy, essentially. However, what he's really known for, at least on that show, is his obsession with conspiracies and his tendency to believe all of them. In one particular episode, the question is being interrogated, or should I say tortured, as the bad guy is trying to get information from him. It's here that the question spouts a few conspiracies, such as topically applied fluoride doesn't prevent tooth decay, but it does render teeth detectable by spy satellite. He would then go on to talk about the bullet that killed JFK, saying, it was forged by Illuminati mystics to prevent everyone from learning the truth. But my favorite, and the one I really wanted to talk about, was when he says, the plastic tips at the ends of shoelaces are called aglets. Their true purpose is sinister. That one always stuck with me, and it made me wonder if the writers had picked this up somewhere. And there's actually a lot of discussion about it online, yet I can't find any real answers. Supposedly, it was just part of a string of key phrases to resist interrogation. Now that I've nerded out, let me move on to another interesting one, which is that Jesus was a Roman psychological operation. And I'm not trying to dispute any religious beliefs here, I'm just telling you the theory. It comes from a book called Caesar's Messiah by Joseph Atwill. It basically states that the Christian Gospels were written under the direction of the first century Roman emperors. Its purpose was to establish a peaceful Jewish faction to counterbalance the militaristic Jewish forces that had just been defeated by the Roman Emperor Titus in 70 AD. This book was received about as well as you would imagine. I've also seen discussion that once Jesus started gathering a following, that Romans, who knew he was a pacifist and taught love and peacefulness, would be perfect for Rome to get behind in order to bring stability to the region. Hey, I didn't say I believe these. I only said they were interesting. Another one I like is that Memphis, Tennessee is cursed, and that's why so much bad stuff happens there. A lot of this comes from the pyramid that was built there and opened as a basketball arena. According to this story, soon after the pyramid was opened in the early 90s, Someone found a box welded to the top of the pyramid. Inside the box was another blue velvet box. When opened, dust flew out, the smell of like incense, and inside was a crystal skull about the size of a fist. And according to the legend, removing the skull from the top of the pyramid cursed the entire city. While that's interesting on its own, there's also a story that the Chickasaw tribe placed a curse on Memphis when they ceded the land to the U.S. in 1818. The city is also allegedly a hotbed for cold activity. And since we just talked about basketball, another one I've heard over the years is that in sports, all the winners are determined ahead of time. Much like wrestling, it is scripted before the game and the winners and losers are chosen. The winners are chosen based on how much they think it will increase the fan interest and how much money it will make. And I guess that's about it. I want to thank everyone for listening and making it through this series with me. I hope you all enjoyed listening to it as much as I did making it. 